Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Today, Andrew continues his teaching on who God is and who we are, recorded live from the 2019 Grace and Faith Conference in Telford, England. You need to recognize that you were an absolute mess before Jesus saved you. Apart from God's influence in your life, you just don't realize how perfect God created us to be. And now, here's Andrew. The law had a purpose, but it revealed the wrath of God. And sad to say, most New Testament believers have not understood the purpose. They thought God gave the law so that we could keep it and thereby earn relationship with God based on our performance. And if that's what you think, it gives you a wrong impression of God. You know, it's like a parent training their children. When your child is little, you have to teach that child that selfishness is not a good thing. And yet every one of us came into this world 100% selfish. You may not have thought about it, but you were. You know, if you had a child in this service right now, we had a child a while ago screaming over here, I don't know what was going on. But you know what? Children, they don't care about anybody but themselves. They don't care if there's 1,000 people, 5,000 people here, whatever, that want to hear the Word. All they think about is themselves. And they'll throw a fit, they'll scream, they'll do anything because they are the center of the universe. <laughs> and every one of us started that way. The sad fact is, most of us are still that way. <laughs> we just now throw adult fits. We've learned how to manage it, but it's still the same principle. But anyway, when your child is little, you have to teach them that selfishness isn't the right thing. You have to correct the child. The Word of God says the rod and reproof gives wisdom. And you know what? When they're one year old, two years old, you can't just sit down and explain things to them. You can't say, now, if you go over there and take that toy, you're being selfish, and that is from the devil. <laughs> and if you keep giving in to selfishness, you'll never have any friends because it'll all be about you. You'll never be able to keep a job. Your marriage will fall apart because you're just... If you try and tell a two-year-old that stuff, they won't understand it. But you know what you can tell a two-year-old? You do that again, and I'll give you a spanking. And they may not even know there is a God or devil or heaven or hell. They may not know anything spiritual, but the next time they want to go steal something, take something, they'll think about a spanking, and they'll go, no. <laughs> and you can train a child to resist evil through corporal punishment. In a sense, that's what the law was. People, it says over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Before people got born again, they couldn't understand things the way that we can. It's through our spirit that we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. And you have an ability to understand God in a way that a person who's not born again didn't have. So before the New Testament, before people got born again, how is it that you teach them to do the right thing? The law was real clear. Go do this and I'll kill you. I'll smite you with the botch, with the mildew, with them rods, amen. If you don't tithe, I'll curse you with the curse. And you know what? Even a lost man understands that. A lost man, will they'll shell out. They'll give in the offering if they are condemned. But under the new covenant, we've got a new way of responding to God. Like over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says, don't give grudgingly or of necessity because God loves a cheerful giver. Give the way you purpose in your heart. It's different under the new covenant than under the old covenant. Why? Because God changed? No, but we changed. We are now born again, and we're a brand new person, and God can deal with us differently. And God did not just all of a sudden change and say, all right, now I'm not going to hold people's sins against them. I'm not going to punish them anymore. That's what a lot of people think grace is about. 
that God now is just full of grace, whereas in the Old Testament he was full of wrath. No, God is the same. He does not change. You know what happened? God placed all of his wrath upon Jesus. And he, he took every bit of wrath and punishment that he had and put your sin and my sin in Jesus. And he punished that sin in Jesus. So God is now just to treat you just as if you never sinned because your sin has been paid for. He didn't just say, all right, I'm going to quit holding people's sin against. No, he paid for that. That's like, you know, if I did something wrong and I went before the judge and the judge turns out one of my best friends, I think, man, this is awesome. I'm going to get out of this because he's my friend. But if he's a just judge, he'll go ahead and give sentence whether I'm his friend or not. That wouldn't be right for him just to say, well, you're my friend, I'm going to let you go. So the judge brings down the gavel and brings judgment upon me. And I said, I thought you were my friend. But then he gets out from behind his desk, comes around, takes his robe off, and he pays my fine for me. See, that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just say, all right, I'm going to let you go and not execute judgment. No, he did execute judgment. He took it upon himself. He suffered for your sin and for my sin, and he paid the debt, and now there is nothing left for you to pay. Amen. Praise God. Look at this passage in John chapter 12. This is Jesus speaking right before his crucifixion. And in John chapter 12, he says in verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by heard it and said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake unto him. But Jesus answered, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. You know, I used to interpret this, that if you just preach Jesus properly, and if you present the gospel accurately, that it'll draw large numbers of people. That's not what this is talking about. And that is not a true statement. Some of the places that have the biggest churches, the biggest crowds are not preaching the true gospel. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that's absolutely true statement. There's a lot of people that compromise and draw people through entertainment and smoke and mirrors and things like that. It is not true that if you just preach Jesus properly, he'll draw lots of people. The word men right here is italicized. And in the King James Bible, the one that you know Paul used, the King James Bible, they were honest enough that when they translated something that wasn't in the original text, they would put it in italics to let you know that this was their interpretation. It wasn't in the original language. So what this actually says is, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all unto me. All what? Well, they just assumed it was talking about all men. But the verse in front of it, says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And the verse after it says, this he said, signifying what death he should die. It wasn't talking about drawing all men unto him. It was talking about bringing all judgment unto him. And so this is saying that when Jesus hung on the cross, he was like a lightning rod, that every bit of God's wrath that the Old Testament law said would come, Every judgment that God had against you and against me, he put it on Jesus. And Jesus literally bore your grief, carried your sorrow. He was bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement of your peace was upon him. God put all of his wrath against you and me upon Jesus so that now he's not just looking the other way. He has paid the price. Your, your debt has been paid. It's done. There's nothing left for you to pay. And now we can experience a grace of God that Old Testament people couldn't. The only way that an Old Testament man could experience the grace that you and I 
experience is by looking forward to what Jesus did. And they would offer an animal sacrifice and they would literally take their hands and they would lay their hands upon the head of this animal and lean on it. What that was, they were transferring their weight, their sin to this animal and then they would slit its throat and offer it because the wages of sin is death. Sin has to be paid for by death. And God allowed people to put their sins upon an animal in symbolism. It wasn't accurate. It even says that in Hebrews chapter 9. It was just, the, it says the blood of bulls and of goats could never take away sin. It was a symbolic thing, but through faith, in a sense, God paid Old Testament saints' sins on credit put it on what Jesus was going to do. They looked forward to what Jesus was going to do. We look back to what Jesus has already done. And because of that, we can truthfully stand before God just as if I'd never sinned, justified because of what Jesus has done. Amen. So I said all of this to try and harmonize some things. There are people that will read 1 John 4, 8 where it says that God is love. And then they'll turn over to the Old Testament where God struck Miriam with leprosy, where God put sickness on a person, where God did something and they'll say, how is that love? And then they come up with these weird doctrines. The Old Testament was God's wrath revealed for a brief period of time. We've basically had 6,000 years since Adam and Eve sinned. The first 2,000 years, God was not imputing man's trespasses unto them. Romans chapter 5 verse 13 says so. He didn't impute their trespasses. Then the law came where he did hold their trespasses against them and said, your sins have separated. But then since Jesus came... He put all of our sin and His wrath for our sin upon Jesus. And so for 2,000 years, there has once again been the grace and the mercy of God ruling and reigning. And it says that in Romans chapter 5, verse 21, talking about that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might righteousness reign uh, uh, through Christ Jesus. And so we now, over 6,000 years, we've had 4,000 years that God has been trying to deal with us in grace and in mercy. That's the true nature of God. He only gave the law temporarily. Galatians chapter 3 says it was temporary until the seed should come to whom the promises were made. And that was talking about Jesus. So I've said all of these things to show you that God is love. And there was a period of time that he dealt with sins in anger and judgment because he was going to show us what we deserved. So it would take away our deception that, you know, God's just got to accept all of us. No, God doesn't have to accept anybody. And it's not based on how holy you are compared to me. Here's God's standard. He showed us a standard that was so holy that it condemned us and shut us up under the faith that would afterwards be revealed through Jesus. That was the purpose of the Old Testament law. But God is a God of love. God wants you well. God wants you blessed. God loves you more than you love yourself. God wants to prosper you more than you want to be prospered. And again, I wish I had time to just share with you so many scriptures, but the Word of God reveals this goodness of God and specifically Jesus. Jesus takes the woman in the very act of adultery and turns around and doesn't say that what she did wasn't sin, but he says, if you're without sin, you cast the first stone. He wouldn't let them punish her because he was going to take her punishment. Jesus became an adulteress when he hung on the cross. He took that adultery into his own body and suffered the payment for that. And that's the true nature of God. God loves you in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. And if you don't understand that and you are being told that you've got to perform and get holy enough so that God will answer your prayer or heal you or deliver you or heal your marriage and you're trying to earn it, Satan will use that wrong thinking to discourage you and stop you. Did you know Satan can't accuse Jesus? When you receive what I'm talking about and your whole attention is on Jesus, Jesus is perfect, Jesus is holy, and Satan cannot impugn his character. But if you think you've got to be holy to deserve God's goodness, 
Boy, Satan can always find something to accuse you over. And you will wind up losing your faith, not because you doubt Jesus is holy, but you think you've got to be holy to earn it. And that will stop you. You're the weak link in the chain. You can't relate to God based on your goodness. You've got to totally put your faith in Jesus and what he's done for you and not your own goodness. And this is where so many people are missing God. They don't understand the true nature and the character of God. God is a good God. He is holy and he's perfect. And you know that you aren't. And so you feel this great gulf between you and God. But I'm telling you that Jesus took all of your sin and bore it for you and he paid for your sins. It says 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, that he is the propitiation. That means the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus has paid for the sins of the whole world. Not only Christians. Unbelievers have had all of their sins paid for. And some people say, well, then that means that they're okay then. No, because they have to mix it with faith. Romans chapter 5 verse 2 says that we have access into this grace through faith. Faith is how you receive what Jesus has done. And if you don't put faith in Jesus, then even though he paid for your sins and the payment has been paid, it will profit you nothing unless you put faith in Jesus. So you have to, you have to receive this. If you doubt, you do without. You got to believe. But Jesus has paid it all. And if you can receive it, now you are in right standing with God it's just as if you'd never sinned. God loves you. God is seeing you in the Spirit. I'll deal with this more this week and explain it in more detail. But God sees you righteous and holy and pure because when you got born again, He created you righteous. You are a brand new creature on the inside. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God sees you differently than you see yourself. And if you can understand it, God is passionate about you. God loves you. God carries your picture in his wallet. God loves you. That is who God is. That is his nature. God is love. But man, you've got to understand it. Did you know that God will be to you what you think him to be? Now that's a statement that you might have to think about. God is who he is regardless of what you think. But God, as far as your experience goes, he will never force himself upon you. He doesn't make things happen without your cooperation. You have to reach out and receive and cooperate. And so if you think that God is not going to bless you because you don't deserve it, then that will stop God from blessing you because you won't believe for freedom. You won't believe for grace. You will believe only that you get what you deserve, and that's what you will experience. That's not the right way to be. So how you see God, if you have a misunderstanding, if you see Him as the one who puts troubles on you, and He's putting sickness on you and poverty and all of these things to break you, well, then what that will do, that'll make you passive when pr troubles come into your life. And the Bible says in James 4, 7, that you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The word resist means to actively fight against. You can't be passive. You've got to resist the devil and he will flee from you. But if you think God is the one who's putting problems into your life, then you can't resist those things or you would wind up resisting God. So it'll make you passive and you will experience all kinds of problems and things that God never intended for you to have. And you'll accept it thinking that it's God. So it's important that you get the right impression of God. God is a good God and you've got to find out who God is, not who you want him to be, not who you've been told that he is. You need to go to the word of God and let the word of God reveal to you who God is and then you need to start relating to him based on the revelation that he gave us. You know, one last thing, let me say right here before I end this tonight. But there's a lot of people 
that will say, well, Jesus was a great man. He was a great example. I remember the guy that made our first television set. He had made these sets for Hollywood stars and stuff. And so anyway, he was working on our set, and I was talking to him about the Lord. And I, I asked him about his standing with the Lord. And he says, well, I believe that Jesus was a great man. He was the greatest example of love that the world has ever seen. But he says, you know, there's many paths unto God, and Jesus is just one path to God. And I said, that is absolutely wrong. And he says, why would you say that? And I said, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. I said Jesus claimed to be the only way. Now, he, he was either who he claimed to be and he was the only way to God or he was a crook. He was a liar. Or at the very best, he was deceived because he said, I'm the only way. And so you can't accept your idea and think, that well, Jesus is just a way. Allah, it's the same thing if you go through Muhammad or it's the same thing if you go through Buddha. No, Jesus is the only way. There is no salvation in anybody else. And it's not up to you to create your own God and to come up with your own thing. The Bible has been proven to be the Word of God. The Bible says that the Word of God is quick. That means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I know it's real because it's working on the inside of me. We've seen our sun raise from the dead. You're too late to tell me that the Word of God isn't God's Word and it's not inspired because it's already inspired me and changed my life. And I'm seeing things happen that couldn't have happened without God. I'm telling you, it's real. Amen. It's alive, and you have to accept the revelation. The Bible is accurate, and if you interpret it correctly, the Old Testament law doesn't contradict Jesus. It shows us what Jesus set us free from. It shows us what we really deserved, and it makes me appreciate my salvation even more when I recognize how holy God is and how unholy I am. Man, that's awesome. And I tell you, God is a good God. He wants only good things for you. It's a lie of the devil. Satan has maligned God, and sad to say, religion has been one of the greatest tools that he's used to turn people against God. And in this nation, you know, there's been a lot of stuff done in the name of God and all of these religious stuff, and I guarantee you it's turned many, many, many people off to God. But true Christianity isn't a religion. It's a relationship with a person. And I tell you, he loves you. And if we would go out and catch on fire for God, the world would come watch you burn. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
go to our website at awmc.ca to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada Helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order. I want to let all of you know who are watching our program in Canada that we have a Canadian office. We also have a website, awmc.ca, and you can go there and you can get all of our materials sent to you from our Canadian office. You can become a partner with us and give, and the money will stay right there to help us reach people in Canada. We would love to help you and minister to you any way we can. If Andrew's teachings are making a difference in your life, consider becoming a Grace Partner with Andrew Womack Ministries Canada today. Go to awmc.ca. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to hearing from you today. Harris is taking it to the next level in Canada. We are raising up leaders in the body of Christ by equipping students to stand on the Word and walk in their calling. I love Karis because it prioritizes the word, and that's what changes you. We stand on the word. Karis is a life changer. I have grown so much in the area that I know that God has called me to. If you would like to be a part of this, go to our website at karisbiblecollege.ca to find out more. Ruth was taught to serve an impersonal and unknowable God, a force never satisfied except through perfection, a belief system founded on idol worship and weekly sacrifices to millions of gods. Ruth carried these beliefs to college, where in this new environment, her life as a Sikh Hindu would never be the same. I start waking up in the night really scared, and then it got quite severe when I'd get demonically attacked at night. I carried on thinking of my own way of dealing with it, to a point where I just thought that the best solution would be just to commit suicide and that would end all the pain and suffering. But it was never God's plan for Ruth's life to be stolen by the enemy. Reaching a breaking point, Ruth began to hear a different voice, a voice that brought peace into a life controlled by fear. I realized there was a significant difference between this voice and the other voices. There's a significant difference between Jesus and the other spirits. So with probably the smallest amount of faith, probably the size of a mustard seed amount of faith, I said, yes, okay, I'll let you help me. This was not the last time God would speak to Ruth in an audible voice. While working at her summer job, he would direct her to leave in the middle of her shift and lead her to a booth at McDonald's. A little African lady appeared in front of me and she told me, today I had an appointment with heaven. And then she started speaking to me about the next step. And she said that when you go to Carrie's Bible College, the whole ministry, everyone involved in the ministry, the people that work there are there by divine appointment. And the teaching that I'll receive is what was intended by God to be preached all over the world. <laughs> 